I'm very happy, brothers and sisters, to have the honor and the privilege of attending this conference with you and trust the few moments I occupy that I may enjoy the Spirit of the Lord so that what I say may be an inspiration to those of you who are here at this conference and those who are listening in. I'm so thrilled with the attitude that our new president, President Kimball, has taken with respect to missionary work. He's indicated that we must lengthen our stride. He wants us to double the number of missionaries that we have. And I think I've been a missionary all my life, ever since I was a small boy. I remember one of the books that I first read as a boy that impressed me was The Life of the Prophet Joseph Smith by George Q. Cannon. And that made such an impression upon my mind and felt and, uh, and caused deep in my heart to have a love for the prophet Joseph and a testimony of the truth of his story that I have felt like I wanted to tell it to all the world ever since that time. I was very much thrilled in our meeting last Thursday with the regional representatives of the 12 in President Kimball's closing remarks to those brethren, the regional representatives, he said that he looks for the day when we will bring in thousands of converts. And then I said to myself, why not? We have the greatest message in all this world. The message we have for the world today is just as important in the sight of the Lord for all of his children as the message was that Peter delivered on the day of Pentecost when the multitudes were smitten in their hearts, pricked in their hearts, and they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And you remember Peter's answer, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and unto your children and all who are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Can there be any greater offer to the searcher after truth today than to answer the same call that Peter gave to those people upon that occasion? Now, the church was established by the Savior through the calling of his twelve and establishing in the church in his day. But the holy prophets foresaw that it would not remain upon the earth, but that there would come a latter day when the Lord would finish his work. The apostle Paul said that the Lord had revealed the mystery of his will to him, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, and we live in that dispensation, that the Lord would bring together in one in Christ all that which is in heaven above and that which is in the earth beneath. Now we have that message, and that's why the world can't adequately and properly find their way back in the presence of the Lord without they are willing to heed the message that we have. I've just completed reading the uh, New Testament, and I've been impressed with the words of the Savior and the Apostle Paul and others of the brethren as I listen to their teachings of their day. The Apostle Paul said, there is one Lord and one faith and one baptism. And then I thought, I wonder what Paul would say if he were here today and know how many churches there are. My secretary checked for me the other day and she learned that last year in May, they took a census and they found that there were 600 and 97 different churches just here in the United States of America. If Paul were here, where would he go when he said there's one Lord and one faith and one baptism? And though, so we have to look for divine guidance in order for us to know where to go to find that true church if there's only one church. And that's our testimony. And our testimony to the world today is a restoration of the gospel. Paul said, uh, but though we are an angel from heaven, 
preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Now that's quite a statement, but Paul was not a, at all backward in indicating what he thought of those that didn't teach the truth as it had come to them through the Savior and through, uh, through the Savior and his teaching. Now, I realize that as I stand here today before this great multitude and all those who are listening in on television and radio, that I come under that condemnation that, Peter, that uh, Paul spoke of if I am not preaching the same gospel that Paul preached. But I bear witness to you today that we have the only true living church upon the face of the earth that the Lord looks to that has divine authority to administer the saving ordinances of the gospel. Great was the day when the gospel was started in the days of the Savior, but it's more glorious when the final uh, finishing touches are put on. Of course, we couldn't have that without the great redemption work that he wrought. But, Peter, or but Paul saw that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, the Lord would bring together in one in Christ all that which is in heaven above and that which is in the earth beneath. And we're the only church in the world that has that. That's the finishing touches. We're in the dispensation of the fullness of time. It was a glorious thing when the Savior, following his resurrection, ascended to heaven in the presence of 500 of the brethren. And two men in quite apparel said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye thus gazing into heaven? Know ye not that this same Jesus, which is taken from you into heaven, shall again appear in like manner as ye have seen him ascend? Now, if the world believes that, then they should be open arms waiting for the prophet of God to come to declare that that has its fulfillment. <clears throat> we read the words of Amos, where Amos said, Surely the Lord God will do nothing but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. In other words, if he were to establish his work in the earth in the latter days, in that dispensation of the fullness of times, in order to bring together in one in Christ all that which is in heaven above and that which is in the earth beneath, he'd have to have a prophet. There's never been a time when God has had a recognized work in the earth that he has recognized without a prophet at its head. Thank God, as we sing in our song, we thank the old God for a prophet to guide us in these latter days. For we have living prophets. We don't have to depend on the dead prophets alone. We have the living prophets to guide and direct us. Now, Jesus was quite a, a definite in his statement, too. He said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And then he adds, Many will say to me at that, in that day, Have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then he would profess unto them, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. Now that's Jesus' pronouncement upon churches that he hasn't authorized and that don't have the divine authority to labor in his name. And then Jesus made this further statement. He said, when the blind lead the blind, they fall in the ditch together. He didn't say that just because they were blind, they'd arrive at the destination. And so we have to be sure and prepare ourselves and know that we found that one and only true church that Paul spoke about. And in order to do that, we have to turn to the words of the holy prophets. Jesus said, Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, for they are they which testify of me. And uh, we, by studying the scriptures, and then he said to his apostles, or to two of his apostles as they were on their way to Emmaus, following his resurrection, he said, O oh, fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And commencing with Moses and the prophets, he showed them how that in all things 
the prophets had testified of him. And then Peter tells us he opened their understandings that they might understand the scripture. And that's what he has done today through the sending of living prophets, through the visit of the father and the son to the prophet Joseph Smith. Could any other message go out to the world to be compared with such a statement as that? And how could the world, who if they love the Lord, how could they hear such a message and then not want to know <clears throat> whether it's true or not? We have a good many people who have been in the ministry join this church. I had a call last week from a minister, a man down in Los Angeles, who served, he told me, for 20 years as a Baptist minister. And then he met the Mormon elders. And they taught him the gospel as it's been restored through the prophet Joseph Smith. And he gave up his ministry, and he's a member of the church. He's now working in the temple there. And he called me to thank me for writing the missionary book that helped him to understand what the Lord has done in restoring his truth to the earth in this dispensation. Just a few years ago, we converted a minister from up in the Northwest, and he sat in my office and he said, Brother Richards, when I think of how little I had to offer my people as a Methodist minister compared with what I now have in the fullness of the gospel as it's been restored, he said, I want to go back and tell all my friends what I've found. Now he said, they won't listen to me. I'm an apostate from their church. But he gave up his ministry, ran the elevator here in our Capitol building so that he could earn enough money to be able to join the church. He sat there in my office and he said, I can't wait until I can go in that temple with my wife. And I since met him in the temple. And then he said, when I joined the church, I didn't feel that I could say that I knew that Joseph Smith was a prophet but I believe that he was a prophet. And he said, but when Brother Burroughs, and I know Brother Burroughs laid his hands on my head and ordained me to the priesthood, something went through my being such as I'd never felt before in all my life. And I knew that no man could do that for me. It had to come from the Lord. Well, that's what we find when people are open-minded enough to be willing to listen and understand what the Lord has really done in restoring his truth to the earth. <clears throat> I'd like to read a little statement here that I published in the book I wrote. It's called, in a pamphlet entitled, The Strength of the Mormon Position. The late Elder Orson F. Whitney of the Council of the Twelve Apostles related the following incident under the heading, A Catholic Utterance. Quote, many years ago, a learned man, a member of the Roman Catholic Church, came to Utah and spoke from the stand of the Salt Lake Tabernacle. I became well acquainted with him, and we conversed freely and frankly, a great scholar with perhaps a dozen languages at his tongue's end. He seemed to know all about theology, law, literature, science, and philosophy. One day he said to me, you Mormons are all ignoramuses. You don't understand the strength of your own position. It is so strong that there is only one other tenable in the whole Christian world, and that is the position of the Catholic Church. The uh, issue is between Catholicism and Mormonism. If we are right, you are wrong. If you are right, we are wrong, and that's all there is to it. The Protestants haven't a leg to stand on, for if we are wrong, they are wrong with us, uh, since they were a part of us and went out with us. They are apostates whom we cut off long ago. If we have the apostolic succession from St. Peter as we claim, there is no need of Joseph Smith and Mormonism. But if we have not that succession, then such a man as Joseph Smith was necessary, and Mormonism's attitude is the only consistent one. It is either the perpetuation of the gospel 
from ancient times or the restoration of the gospel in latter days. Now, if the members of these 697 different churches could realize the consistency of that statement, they'd want to know by what authority their ministers are performing the ordinances in their church. Because if the statement of this prelate is true, they either must be Catholics or Mormons. Then I always add that the Catholics and the Bible can't both be right because the Bible definitely proclaims an apostasy from the original church and a restoration in the latter days. You remember when John was banished upon the Isle of Patmos and the angel of the Lord said, Come up hither, and I will show you that which must be hereafter. Now this was all 30 years after the death of the Savior. And the angel showed John the power that would be given to Satan to make war with the saints, and the saints were the followers of Jesus, and to overcome them and to rule over every nation kindred, tongue, and people. That doesn't let anybody out. That's a definite statement of a complete apostasy from the original church. But the angel didn't leave it at that. Then he showed John another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell upon the earth, and to every nation, and every kindred, and every tongue, and every people. Now, obviously, no angel would need to come from heaven with the everlasting gospel if that everlasting gospel had remained upon the earth. And the everlasting gospel is the only gospel that can save men. And so that's our message to the world that we have that everlasting gospel. Now, I want to give you one more reference. Peter said the heavens were to receive the Christ until the time of the restitution of all things spoken by the mouths of all the holy prophets since the world began. We have that restitution, and any lover of truth can know that as well as they know that they live if they're willing to investigate like Jesus said, for my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do the will of the Father, he shall know of the doctrine whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. We have that restitution of all things, and no one can believe Peter was a prophet and look for the coming of the Savior until there is such a restitution. And that's my witness to you, and I pray God to bless you that this work may spread abroad and fill the earth, and I do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Well, that part goes too fast.